All right, today we're going to go into uh, our sermon series that has been happening for the past uh, three weeks. Today is week four in James. Uh, we're in, still in James chapter one, James chapter one, verse 12. If you would, uh, if you have your Bibles, please turn with me. If not, it'll be on the screen for you uh, so that we can read along and follow along uh, this morning. Uh, yeah, James chapter one, verse one, uh, verses 12, verse 12, sorry. Would you please stand out of the reverence of the living word of God? James chapter 1, verse 12. It's quite short. Uh, let's, read it. Uh, let's read it together out loud. Here we go. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. This is the word of God. Would you read it just one more time? It's really short. One more time with me. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. This is the word of God. Praise be to God. Please have a seat. Let me pray for us once again before I begin my sermon. Heavenly Father, Lord, in our lives, there are various kinds of trials and tests. But Lord, I pray that your people, your children who are gathered here today, that they will be encouraged onto steadfastness in their lives. Help them, help us to see the truth that is in your word today. The words that your uh, Jesus' half-brother, uh, James, wrote, inspired by the Holy Spirit for us, that it would be beneficial to us, that it would be encouraging, edifying to this congregation, Lord. I pray that it will help us to run the race with endurance, Lord, that we would remain steadfast in the face of temptation, trial, and persecution, so that... When we have stood it, when we have stood the test, that we might receive from you, Lord, the crown of life eternal. We lift up this time to you, God. I pray that you would use me as your mouthpiece to share your message to your people here, Lord. Though I'm an unworthy servant, I pray that you would use me today to share your message, your gospel, to, who, uh, to those who have ears in this place. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Uh, in South Korea, every year on TV, uh, several TV broadcasting companies, right? Uh, TV companies uh, have uh, their annual uh, entertainment award ceremonies, right? Just like in the U.S., but uh, in Korea, they make a little bit more deal out of it, I think, right? Um, and the biggest award every year uh, given uh, during that ceremony is called in Korean the Taesang, right? It's called the Taesang. And in English, it literally means the big one. Taesang. If you want to fact check me, I don't know, you can ask people who are good at Korean. Last year, 2023, uh, a from NBC. NBC is like one of the top two like biggest uh, uh, broadcasting companies in, in Korea. NBC, right, 2023, Taesang, the big one, was given to a guy named Kian Parsa, right? That's his name, right? Kian, or K-I-A-N, 84, right? That's not actually his name, but that's like his like tag, right? Uh, Kian, 84. He won the big one, <laughs> you know, and it was a pretty special thing. It was all over the, uh, all, the all over the news, right? I'm sure some of you guys know about it. Um, it was a special thing uh, because, from from at least my understanding, he was the first person, right, out of the 50 years of this award ceremony tradition, he was the first person to be a non-entertainment person to receive this award. Does that make sense? Right? He wasn't. Uh, originally a celebrity. The, the award is usually given to uh, a celebrity, right? Whether it be an actor or, or a comedian, whatever it is. But he, uh, he is actually just really an ordinary person, right? That got a lot of screen time uh, through this one show that shows 
how single people live in Korea, right? Uh, I'm sure some of you guys know what, it, what that show is. But uh, Kian84, uh, originally he's a webtoon artist, right? I know what a webtoon is. A webtoon artist, right? Um, and he got famous through that show. And uh, Judith and I, we, we actually love that show. We watch it every, every Friday if we have time uh, or Saturday if we don't have time. Uh, but anyways... Uh, one of the reasons, right, one of the big reasons, one of the big events that led up to this guy receiving that award was, and I think this is probably the deciding factor, right, between, between him and other celebrities that were like candidates to re receive the big one, was this, right, on the show that he like comes out on, on every week, on that show, he ran a marathon, Okay? He ran a marathon, right? And for me, when I saw that, I mean, it's on TV and it's like, I don't know, like maybe I shouldn't trust it, but I don't know. When I saw that he ran a marathon, I was like, man, this guy deserved, the, he deserves the big one, you know? Because that's a marathon. And that marathon is no joke, right? Has anyone actually ran a marathon in our ministry? No? Hey, if you want to, you could be the first one. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> You know, I could be a, uh, a skeptic and think maybe he, Keon84, maybe he just ran it so that he would win the award. Maybe, right? Maybe he knew that his chance would be way up if he ran a marathon. But for me, I'm leaning more on the side of uh, w whether or not his motive was sideways or whatever. You know, I, I want to give him credit for running the marathon, right? Like, he, he saw the goal that he wanted to achieve, whether that be finishing the marathon or getting the award. He knew the direction in which he needed to go to achieve that goal. And most importantly, what many people are missing, most importantly, he got there, right? He got there to the finish line. Brothers and sisters, most people don't have the courage or the mentality, or the persistence to not only start the race, but to finish it. What's more important, starting the race or finishing the race? It's about how you finish, right? That's what we need to talk about today. How true Christians need to not only run the race, but run it in a way that would eventually end up in that Christian Finishing the race. Because too often you and I see Christians giving up in the middle of that race. Or calling it quits before they get to the end of the race. Running in the wrong direction we see Christians doing. Running in circles we see Christians doing. Running in place sometimes. And some people seemingly are always just warming up for the race. And never in the race. Brothers and sisters. You have to know this. You and I, if you're a Christian, you and I need to know this. There are people, many, many, many people in this world who do not know Christ, who do not know God, but they place immense amount of value and they put forward immense amount of effort in whatever race that they're running. And these people who don't know Christ, they put an immense amount of effort to run their respective races for a perishable crown. For a perishable crown. Things that won't last. There are people who can devote so much time into perishable crowns. But you and I, Christians, or maybe so-called Christians, can't decide whether or not we were, we're going to put all of our chips on the table. For the big one, the imperishable crown, as the Bible talks about, the imperishable crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Are we together? Today, brothers and sisters, I think you and I need to put ourselves under the microscope. Are you in the race is the question. Are you withstanding the resistance, the trials that come with the race? Are you running full 
focused on the final reward, the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him? Or are you just a bystander watching everyone run by? Are you just warming up? Have you been warming up this whole time? When are you going to get in the race? Or maybe you think you've ran a few miles and that's enough. Or maybe you lost sight of the finish line of the final reward. Whatever the case may be, brothers and sisters, I pray today, after today, that you and I, we all run together in the same direction with the same purpose towards the finish line, the crown of life. Amen. In the last three weeks, Last three weeks, we've gone through uh, the beginning uh, verses, the first uh, 11 verses of the book of James. And through the uh, 11 verses, we, we learned of uh, certain spiritual tendencies that true Christians uh, must bear, right? In verses 2, 3, and 4, the main message that James, who is a half-brother of Jesus, that James was getting across is that Christians must have what? Spiritual stamina. Right? In the face of various trials, in the face of various persecution and hardship, regardless of the circumstances or the severity of that suffering, James called the Christians who are dispersed or across the Mediterranean area to count it all, what? Joy. Amen. G- James called for a spiritual spirit stamina, right, in the face of persecution. And he said, through this spiritual stamina, Christians would be able to produce spiritual perfection or spiritual completeness. Not perfect Christians, but spiritual stamina or steadfastness, right, and that Christians who are who who are living up to the standards set by God, regardless of the circumstances, that they are the ones who are actually producing this spiritual steadfastness or what you and I came to understand as spiritual completeness. Spiritual stamina, that was verses 2, 3, and 4. In verses 5, 6, and 7, and 8, the main message there that we found was that true Christians must illustrate spiritual integrity. I know you know it. Spiritual integrity is that Christians who are given wisdom by God in its entirety would live by it. Would not only know it, but that they would live by it. That they would not only know of the way that God is calling us to live, not only know of the gospel, but that the convictions of knowing that in your heart, right, through the divine wisdom given by God in its entirety, that that would lead sinners to salvation. That the convictions of your heart would translate to your deeds and actions. That was spiritual integrity. Last week, we talked about something else. Last week in verses 9, 10, and 11, James was calling that true Christians bear Spiritual, identity, amen, we're together, right, or the question is, we've been together, right, (laughs) spiritual stamina, spiritual integrity, spiritual identity, spiritual identity, right, James called that true Christian spiritual identity must be firmly based on their present status even now as a child of God and future inheritance that is to come when we meet God face to face. James said, a true Christian with proper spiritual identity would not boast in the riches of the world, nor would they roast those who lack riches, but they would boast only in knowing God. They would be secure in what God has given them presently in the world now and what God has promised to come in the future. Spiritual identity. And today, this week, we're going to look at one more spiritual thing. It's the same theme here. Today, we're going to look at spiritual 
grit. <laughs> Spiritual grit, okay? What do I mean by that? Do you guys know what grit means? Um, Merriam-Webster, I don't know how to say it. Merriam-Webster Dictionary Online. Grit means firmness of mind or spirit. Unyielding courage in the face of hardship or danger. For me, I think I, I could upgrade this definition a little bit uh, for, to fit our context. Spiritual grit, right? Spiritual grit is the unyielding persistence that produces steadfastness of Christians in the face of various trials. You got that? Spiritual grit is the unyielding persistence that produces steadfastness of Christians in the face of various trials. Trials, persecution, temptation, and so on. That's a long definition, right? And so I, I try to bring it down, make it a little bit more palatable so that you could memorize it and take it with you. Spiritual grit is then unyielding persistence that produces endurance. Simple, yeah? Spiritual grit is unyielding persistence that produces endurance. You know, you, you and I know, right? I love rhyming, right? Even though you guys don't like it, I love it. <laughs> I love it. And so I really wanted right? Spiritual stamina, integrity, identity. I wanted to rhyme and I wanted to give you spiritual mentality, but it didn't really work with me. I didn't really like it. And then I thought about spiritual vitality or spiritual capability. I, I, didn't, like, I didn't like it. So I gave up the rhyming and I'm giving you this, spiritual grit. And I think I like it a lot, right? Unyielding persistence that produces endurance. Verse 12, let me remind you. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God promised to those who, have, who, who love him. You know, you might remember from the first sermon of this series uh, in verses 2, 3, and 4, what, what James was saying at that time was, or, or not at the, at the different time, but a few verses before, James was charging us, right? James was uh, encouraging or, or commanding us to respond to trials of various kinds with joy, right? James says, count it all as joy, right? And, that, and he said, to count it all as joy is to keep the standard regardless of the circumstances. And that standard is to count it all as joy. No matter the circumstance, no matter the difficulty, no matter the hardship, count it all as joy. Here in verse 12, James says, to those who have responded to the trial, trials of various kind with joy, to them, if they finish the race, if they withstand the test, counting it all as joy until the end, if they see to the end of that test, there is a reward. Trials, tests, very difficult things. Circumstances that might hinder or threaten your faithfulness to Christ, your relationship with God, or your love of God, right? Circumstances that, that might hinder or threaten your love of God. That's why it says in, in verse 12 that, that this is a promise to those who love him, right? To, to, the, to those who love him, not temporarily, but to the end, throughout the trial, throughout the test, throughout the race. You know, James, James is referring to persecution here, right, of the early church, right? In that time, the persecution was real. People were dying for the faith, right? In that time, people, there was a risk of the early church wavering in their faith because of persecution, and I think you and I could interpret this verse and, and apply it to our current time because persecution in the church or persecution of the world on the church is causing Christians today to love the world rather than God. I hope you see that. So 
tests and trials, it really could be a variety of things, many, many things. It could be physical illness, death of a loved one, victim of abuse, financial hardship, or maybe even just current events in the world, disasters, wars. James, knowing that different churches with different people in different situations, different circumstances are going to be reading this letter, he says, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. Putting all of us under this one umbrella. Blessed is the man who, withstand, who remains steadfast under trial. I mean, if you, if you know, uh, if, or if you, if you haven't with us for at least maybe a couple of years, blessed is the man. It's, a, it's like a formula, right? We, we've seen this before. It could be Psalm 1, blessed is the man that meditates on the law of the Lord. Or Matthew 5, 3, right, where, where Jesus gives the beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, where there's the kingdom of heaven, and so on and so forth. In the same way, he uses that same formula, right? James says, blessed is the man who remains steadfast right blessed is the man who is steadfast no that's not what James is saying James he says blessed is the man who remains steadfast right it doesn't matter whether you're steadfast today you have to remain steadfast till the end that's who James is talking to those who have spiritual grit to remain steadfast until the end, they have a reward. It's not enough. It really isn't. When you're running a marathon to know which direction to run, that's not enough, is it? To know how much you have to run is not enough to finish the race. To have on the best running shoes it's not enough to have the lightest Lululemon material running shorts. It's not enough to finish the marathon. There is only one way of finishing the race. You run in the right direction until you get to the finish line. 1 Corinthians 9.25, it says this, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body, keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Brothers and sisters, people spend their lifetime pursuing perishable wreaths, right? And it's, it's respectable things too, right? You saw, you saw the Olympic, you know, this past summer, right? The athletes, they devote their lives. They train and train and train. They eat the right stuff. They sleep the right way. They train the right way. They walk, they talk, they breathe the right way so that they might win gold, so that they might win silver maybe too and bronze. You and I, you and I can run for an imperishable, eternal crown. Eternal life with God. Who should be more devoted to their race? Those who are running for a perishable wreath or an imperishable? You and I should be devoted to the race. Amen. We need to eat the right stuff. Drink the right stuff, train the right way. We need to talk the talk and walk the walk. You know, brothers and sisters, do we have runners in our ministry? I know, I know we haven't run the marathon, but do we have runners? I don't know. I used to run at least consistently, very little, but consistently, way when I was in high school, right? A long time ago. But the thing is, I know this. So I, at least with experience, I can say, Right? When I start running, when I start running, I think about all sorts of stuff. Right? I'm a minute into the run and I'm like, oh shoot, my legs are chafing. I, I gotta stop. Oh man, it's too cold out. My lungs hurt. I should stop. Man, if I, if I use all my energy right now, then I'm not gonna have energy to do homework later. I'm not gonna have the energy to do laundry later. I should stop. 
It's drizzling. It's raining a little bit. My ankles might get hurt. I should stop. There's too many crazy drivers in New York. I'm not going to run out here. There's too many mosquitoes in Virginia. I'm not going to run. I should stop. As soon as I start running, there's resistance. Internal, for sure. External, too. Internally, I'm thinking, I'm talking about my attitude, my commitment, my purpose. All of that comes into question as soon as I start running. There's resistance when you run. Externally, the wind, the storm, maybe, uh, maybe my body, I don't know, my weight, I don't know, all of that. Externally, that's resistance too. As soon as you start running, everything work, is working against you to stop running. Brothers and sisters, please know and be encouraged today. When you face resistance, face it with persistence. You like that? When you run, there's going to be resistance. And so you got to face it with resistance every time. What does that mean? Keep running. Keep going. Keep pursuing. If you stop, if you have stopped... Get back up, get back in the race. When I was in seminary, I I think I shared this, uh, I don't know, probably sometime this year, right? But for me, I I probably endured some of the lowest times of my life while I was attending seminary, right? And I I tell sometimes the discipleship group, right, that, I mean, they have to come to church every Sunday. I said, I skipped my first Sunday service right, out of my own intent when I was in seminary, right, when I was training to be a pastor, right. But the thing is, every single day when I was in seminary, I would walk down these set of stairs, and in the staircase, there is a huge poster, and it's written in Korean. I don't know why it's written in Korean, but it's from Revelation 2, 10. Be faithful unto death. Revelation 2.10, it says, this is Jesus saying, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Do not fear what you're about to face, what you're about, the resistance you're about to face, the persecution you're about to face. Behold, Jesus says, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. And that's what happened in the early church, that you may be tested, and for 10 days you will have tribulation. Jesus knows Jesus knows his people are going to face tribulation, persecution, and suffering. The next words, he says, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Amen? Finish the race, he says. Finish the race. Run the race until you see Jesus face to face. Because only then... Only then you will receive the crown of life. The crown promised by God, given to those who love God until the end. Run with unyielding persistence that produces endurance. As we start uh, one-on-one discipleship, right? One, the, the first Bible verse we memorize as a group is Hebrews 12, 1 to 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. How? Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, Endure the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. How do we run? Spiritual grit, how does it happen? When you look at Jesus, who ran with joy the race that was set before him. Even though that race consisted of him being humiliated on the cross, he had to be 
in this shameful position before all of his creation. Only then, when he obeyed and ran until the end, until he finished his work, did he sit down at the right hand of the throne of God. Brothers and sisters, spiritual grit. You and I are called to run today with persistence. The race that is set before us with endurance, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who ran that race perfectly. He finished the race obeying God's will. I want to encourage you today. Let's run this race together. I feel like we should start like a running club or something. Alley Pond Park, anyone? Brothers and sisters, run with endurance. The race that is set before us looking to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray.